Welcome to The Voice Versus. My guest today has been called the most controversial martial artist in history. His amazing story and the movie Bloodsport, based on his winning the underground kumite tournament, influenced an entire generation of martial artists and continues to do so today. What you're about to hear are truly amazing stories. Believe what you will. From undercover black ops to the realities of the Kumite, working with Jean-Claude Van Damme, influencing the early UFC, pioneering mixed martial arts, and much more. This is The Voice versus Frank Dukes. Frank Dukes, welcome to The Voice Versus. It's an absolute pleasure. My pleasure. Just to clarify uh, for our viewers, the reason you're wearing sunglasses, of course, is because due to the impact you took, the head trauma you took in your years of fighting, you suffered two brain tumours, and these days your eyes are very sensitive to light, correct? Correct. That's actually very astute of you. Let's uh, talk a bit about Bloodsport up front. In an interview with Barbara Rich, when she asked how the movie Bloodsport has affected you personally, you said it's been a blessing and a curse. What did you mean by that? Well, it, you know, it sets you up for a lot of people in life, basically, the, uh, they want to tear you down. Uh, Bruce Lee, I think, said it best. You know, when you get on top, you know, you become sort of like uh, the game of uh, uh, King of the Mountain, you know, and that's what it is. I mean, a lot of people, even though they're successful in life, it's not enough that they're successful. They, they have to see everybody else fail. And someone like myself, when I, you know, I, I made so many firsts in my life. You know, I was the first person, for example, to buck the system and fight in, in, in you know, bicycle shorts that I customized that everybody's using today. Um, I was the first person to, to win the Kumite as, as far as being a Caucasian. And Bloodsport, like I said, it, 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 it set me up as a target, but at the same time it allowed me to be... Uh, have opportunities and open doors I would never ever possibly have in my life, especially when it comes to helping other people. And that's where I look at it as a blessing. You mentioned Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. Joseph Sinder, who was the advertising and publicity director for Warner Brothers between 1968 and 71, said in a July 2002 interview that Bruce Lee had heard how fast you were as a martial artist and wanted to meet you. Is that true back when you were a teenager? Did you ever hear back then of Bruce Lee knowing who you, are, who you were and knowing how fast you were? Yeah, well, here's a funny story behind that. I didn't have money to, to, to pay for lessons. So I would go to Bill Riyasaki's school in Lancashire Boulevard, and I would go to the Chinese store next door, and I would actually work to get the broom and the pail and, and the cleaning supplies. And I would go to Bill Riyasaki's school, and I would, I would clean the windows and the sidewalk Nothing ever spoken between us. And Bruce Lee would come in there, and he was, they were friends. And he, Bill would watch me in the window, watch me work out. He would see me at tournaments. He would see what I was doing. And he would always nail Bruce about, you're not that quick, <laughs> you know. And then on top of that, here, here's the other thing. You know, there's a, a lot of people tell, tell the story where Bruce Lee beat Victor Moore in a contest of speed, okay. And Vic, it's actually the other way around. Vic beat beat Lee in that contest. So let me jump in there, Frank. Victor Moore, of course, a former USKA, PKA World Karate Champion. You fought Victor Moore in his heyday. He said that you were, and I quote Victor here, faster than all of us back then, including Bruce Lee. I told everyone this was the up-and-comer to watch. Correct. Absolutely. So Absolutely. you saw Bruce Lee train? I, I saw him as a kid, yeah. How fast was he, in your opinion? I mean, he was lightning fast, but... I was kind of a freak of nature, and I ended up with an extraordinary amount of what called fast twitch muscle fiber. And so, you know, I, I mean, I, I did a bet once with a with a with, with a guy where they actually had a snake and it l latched at me, and I actually caught it. Oh. And I used to do the fish thing too, and you see in blood's work. Um, in fact, I did it here in Las Vegas one time. I was a funny story. I was in. Uh, 
I think it was the Hilton, they had a koi pond or something. Some guy said, oh, I don't believe you're, you're, you're Frank Dukes. If you're Frank Dukes, get that fish. And I did, of course, and handed it to him. <laughs> and, of course, the manager wasn't too happy because I understand it was like a you know $4,000 fish. <laughs> so, Tell me so. about your instructor, Sinzo Tanaka. I mean, in the movie Bloodsport, we see the character Frank Dukes being pulled between bamboo trees, being hit repeatedly with a stick, being blindfolded, doing a tea ceremony, some pretty intense training. Was any of that true? Absolutely. In fact, um, we actually, when I had a hold of John claude I, I trained him for three months before we did the movie. And uh, that scene where you see him being stretched, that's real. Really? That's real. People thought that was like all stage, but he actually did that to his credit. He actually got out there. They were stretching him. He was, he was between those posts, and he actually pulls himself in and really does it. And that's one of the reasons I think it rang through, and you never saw that in the movie, because if you look, there's no wiring in those days. There's no way to do it that way. We didn't have the you know, capability to digitally take things out. How true are the techniques that Jean-Claude uses in the movie to the techniques you actually use to win the Kumite? Well, they're, they're pretty... They're, Pretty correct, right down to like what happened with my eye um, when I actually fought the the a lot of guys use dit dow and it'll come up in your sweat. Now um, I choose to believe that it wasn't intentional that he actually took the dit dow from his sweat and flicked it into my eye, just coming off the. That punch. was in the final match, like yeah, in the movie. Exactly, and I I, I think. Now, which I should say is not an uncommon occurrence for those thinking that it's BS because, of course, Liston did it to Muhammad Ali. Right. Uh, in K-1, uh, Jerome LeBanner did it to Mark Hunt. It right. actually happens more than you'd think in fighting. Oh, absolutely. And that's why I was trained blindfold. The, my instructor made sure I trained blindfold just for that reason because you can't have your eyes taken away that quickly. And uh, so that, kind, that really happened. Now, Lawrence Day, who was in my corner, um, he, he, you know, from the Black Dragon who watched it, he, he insists, and he, he told, uh, I think it was uh, Barrett Mills, that, it, that uh, basically that was intentional. He saw that was intentional. It was it, how they did that. But I fought on and, of course, won, won that. And, of course, the, the helicopter kick John claude does, you know, there's pictures of me doing the exact same kick. How true was Bloodsport a depiction of the actual competitors who took place in the Kumite? For example, was there a real-life Jackson? Oh, yeah. In fact, Jackson's actually a composite of two people. It was a composite of uh, Kurt Peterson, who was a very famous uh, Kyoko Shinkai uh, black belt. He was, he was actually pretty famous for her. I think he was the one who broke uh, Dolph Lundgren's jaw uh, when they fought in, uh, uh, to go to uh, the match, I think Masayama's match okay. in, J in Japan. And another guy named Rick Robinson. Was there a real-life Chong Lee? Oh, yeah. Did uh, Chong Lee ever kill a man in a competition like oh, yeah. it's depicted in the movie? Oh yeah, that happened quite a bit. And he, people don't, don't, don't understand that. And that, that hold, on, hold on, Frank. It happened quite a bit with Chong Li or with other competitors or mostly oh, with Chong Li? A lot Lee? with Chong Li, actually. Did you ever get to see? Yeah, actually I did. How did you see him kill a man? Well, it, it wasn't deliberate. Again, what happened was, you have to understand, that time we didn't, you, you had a concussion, you were told to man up. And these poor guys back then, very rarely Kumite fighters, lived beyond the age of 30 to 40 years old. I was very lucky. I probably survived because I, had, I was known for very quick knockouts. And I really didn't take the abuse a lot of these guys did. But the majority of these guys, what they would do is this is their bread and butter. And they were owned. Literally, the gym would own them. And they, a guy would get, a, he'd get knocked out. And he, he, you know, let's say on a Tuesday, and he's back Thursday fighting again. He might get knocked down Thursday, and he's back again. Guess what? Sunday, maybe he, meet, he wins that match, and maybe he wins four more. Then they put him in a kumite, he gets one hit, it's all over. How did you witness Chong Lee kill someone? What, the, what, what technique was used? How, how did it come about? Oh, man. He basically, he put a choke on the guy, and then basically what happened is the guy fought from the choke, and he gave, he gave him just one shot to the, to the temple here, and the guy went down. He was out, but he, he didn't die in the ring. He died, he died that later that night. I mean, you're you 19 know. years old when you saw this? Yeah, I was 19. Did that scare you, knowing you're in a tournament where, I mean, you fought people like Victor Moore, but you've, you've seen tournaments like in Long Beach where there's a lot of rules to it, and here you see a guy, this Chong Lee guy, kill someone in front of you. You're well, 19 he, years old. Well, you've got to remember, he didn't die in front of me. He, di he died... But you that would have night. Heard, gotten word yeah, that you died that of night. Of course, of course. And it was very different then. Our fights were different. We had a certain respect. 
it, it was you didn't fight for money then, and you, didn't, you were certainly fighting for fame, because it, they weren't really publicized. It was all about really learning. It was all about taking your technique of your style, and seeing if it really worked. It was really a con, more of a contest of that of pride amongst martial arts. It was a very different mindset than the the mindset today. You know, today most guys fight for a way to assert their manhood. It's, it's sort of a, a rite of passage for them. Where in our day, it was more along the lines of, no, I want to honor my instructor. I want to honor my ancestry. I want to honor, stand, honor my lineage for a lot of people. And that's why they got out there and did what they did. How did you defeat Chung Lee? Whoa. Well, <laughs> there's a number of ways. Uh, I think the best defeat I ever gave with Chung Lee was... Oh, um, you fought Chung Lee more than once? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Let's get specific, though, Frank. Your final match, yeah. when you won the Kumite in the Bahamas, how did you specifically beat Chong Lee? Did you knock him out with a kick, a punch? Did you choke him? How did you beat him? Did you make him say mate like in the movie? I made him say mate like in the movie. How? I, I was a really good grappler. I started off in jiu-jitsu. That's where I trained with Jack Seki. And so once I knew I got him in that position, then it was, it was all over. So I, I, ba I basically submitted him out. One of the most remembered parts of the film is obviously when... The Frank Duke's character does the dim mark, the yeah. death touch. Were you actually required to do that in real life to prove yourself? Did you perform a dim mark? Tell me about that. Oh yeah, yeah I, I, I've done it a number of times on television. I, I where I do the uh, break the bottom, break leave the top one attack. It's what it is. It's really a, a controlled kinetic energy break. Could you punch me now, and I wouldn't feel the effect of it, but in a few hours' time, I would. Oh yeah. Chop dead. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, you'd be in a hospital. Let's put it that way. It'd probably be your heart valve coming loose. Oh. What about the uh, quarter snatching trick we see in blood sport? Very real. real. In fact, I was inspired to do that by hearing about Bruce Lee doing it. And so he would do the same thing, and I, I learned to do it. And I'm happy to do it for you if you want. <laughs> really? Really. Do it right now. Okay. I've got a quarter here. All right. So I'm placing it in my hand. Right. Now, the aim is for me to close my hand before you can snatch the quarter. Right. Just open your hand. You ready? We can do it again. <laughs> Jeez. Quick. <laughs> hey, I did the coin, the coin trick with Frank Dukes. That's pretty cool. Up next on The Voice Versus. I, I, I really loved Jean-Claude as a person. I watched this addiction and the people around him taking him down. Let's talk about someone else. Yeah. Let's talk about Jean-Claude Van Damme and, and your relationship with Jean-Claude. Uh, you did train with him for three months in preparation for blood sport. Yeah. When you first started training with Jean-Claude, what level of martial artist was he and what were you able to accomplish with him in those three months? He was very stiff. He was from a Shotokan background, that was yeah. obvious. He did some kickboxing. Uh, he, he was... At the same time, he, he had a plus. He did ballet, very stretched. He, he approached it from a dancer's point of view, and he was learning the movements from, a, chore from, from, a, from a, a dancer doing choreography. Now, that's not to take anything away from him. Uh, I can tell you when I trained him, um, he could fight. Were you surprised at how short in stature Jean-Claude is? I know when I met Jean-Claude for the first time, I was surprised that he's... I mean, you're, you're a big guy, Frank, and to, yeah. for him to... Depict you in the film, given his stature, he's, John Claude is n nowhere near as big as you. No, but what got him apart is basically this, and that is, I'd gone to see a film, actually it was uh, Sheldon Lettich, who wrote Bloodsport, called me up and he says, Frank, I just saw an advertisement and, and you're not going to believe it, this guy looks just like you, and he's in this movie called No Retreat, No Surrender. So we go see the movie. And then I realized, I said, you know, Mark, I talked to Mark. I said, Mark, if you're going to shoot in Hong Kong, I said, where are you going to find anybody playing my size? All the guys were heavyweights. And I had to fight to get John claude that part. Um, and that was part of the deal. Okay, he trains with you for three months to look like you. And, if you, and I said, look, I can make him look fantastic. But what really makes Bloodsport come alive is people go back and they see that film over and over again because of the reality of it. They recognize the reality in the choreography. And that's not something that's easily duplicated. I think a lot of people take it for granted. That's why Bloodsport 2 never went anywhere. You know, it doesn't have my style of, uh, of choreography. Same thing with Jean-Claude. When I stopped doing his choreography, where did, it, where did it go? 
You once said that Jean-Claude was industrious in the early days, but then got caught up in the Hollywood lifestyle and it destroyed him. Do you still believe that? Absolutely. I mean, I remember, he, he, you know, you couldn't give him an aspirin, all right? Uh, he was totally against steroids. He was just a hard-working kid. He uh, just affable, he couldn't believe. But the people he started to surround himself with just started pumping him up, and he became a victim of, I honestly believe he became a vic victim of, of um, too many temptations, opportunity. In 1988, you sued Jean-Claude. Now, yeah. you were friends with Jean-Claude. You were even dating his sister-in-law. Yeah, I loved uh, Denise. So what were the circumstances that led you to sue Jean-Claude? Oh, gosh. It, I, I really loved Jean-Claude as a person. I watched his, 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 I watched this addiction and the people around him taking him down. And there's a thing, if you really love someone, if you do things in life, you have to, what I call, risk the relationship. And so what I did is basically I, I, I brought, made him accountable. Nobody sues a, a person like him in, in Hollywood. You just don't do it. It's the end of your career. And people say it's the money. What was the money? I would have taken the settlement. You know, I offered him a counter settlement. Uh, he, one, you have to go see your kids. Two, you have to go through a complete a drug addiction program. That was, my, that, that was my thing for him. People don't ever talk about that part. And I think that's because the attorneys actually hid that from him on both sides because they're after the money. You were actually suing him, though, to do with the quest? To the quest. Basically what happened is I wrote, I wrote the quest with a guy named Ed Kamara. Uh, Sheldon Lettuce comes in afterwards along with uh, these other guys. They basically take my whole script, paraphrase it. You know, instead of like uh, I, I had a balloon, they put in blimp or, you know, bar saloon. That's, I mean, that's how ridiculous it got. They took an A script that would have been a really serious film for Jean-Claude and literally turned it into this, you know, let's make a quick buck, you know, uh, prepay kind of deal for, for the producers. So here I wrote this thing, and the next thing you know, my name's not on it. I was supposed to choreograph it. I'm not doing it. I'll never forget it. I was on the stand, and he's, he were, I was talking about the money, and I started crying because it wasn't it wasn't money. It was really about here's my friend, and he couldn't stay in the courtroom after that. The judge let him out of the courtroom, and I think he did a tremendous disservice because all I was asking is like, wh I mean, who goes to court and says to the other guy, just go to go to counseling. That's all I want you to do. This is over done it, and it didn't happen you, you understand what I'm saying yeah. and and I'm bringing this all up not because of like poor woe is me I don't want anybody to think that I want them to understand how hard a battle it was for me with all the evidence on my side I mean I wrote the script that's you know it's there it's done what was Jean-Claude going up against that's what I want people to understand you know a lot of people are really quick to condemn the guy they're really quick to say, oh, you know, he's this and that. He didn't have a chance. I, I mean, I really, my, my, uh, uh, my heart goes out to him. It really does because I really saw a guy come to Hollywood with dreams, sell it all, put his, put his, put his heart into it, and then I watched this thing eat him up and, and, and some real evil people, you know, just, just take it. And, and I'm a fighter. I'm going to fight. You know? And I fought a battle I know I, I couldn't win. You want to condemn me for that? Go ahead. But at least, hey, I keep my integrity. You know, you take an attitude if you're a true martial artist. And the attitude isn't about whether you're going to win the battle or not. It's about how you live your life. You define your life by the way you live it. Uh, and it's a practice this summer I call motion, dead or ready. And I've always had that attitude. And that's probably why uh, you asked me a question earlier. I was afraid and all this. Yeah, but I also was trained by some of the greatest guys in the world, Tanaka for one, who instilled that in me. You know, and that's something that's missing in these MMA guys. They go out and it's all, a, lot of t a lot of times it's all about ego. You know, and that'll, get in the, that'll kill you. That'll, that's a predator of all relationships, all things. Coming up on The Voice Versus, they basically looked at me as cannon fodder. They, they all thought, you know, the, the Orientals who brought me over thought, there's just no way. The guy has no real lineage. He, you know, 
How, how is this guy going to beat us? Let's talk about the Kumite. Yeah. 1975. Right. You're age 19. You compete in an underground Kumite tournament, not in Hong Kong, as depicted in the movie, but in Nassau in the Bahamas. Right. How was it that a 19-year-old white Canadian got invited to compete in this underground Kumite in the Bahamas? I originally wasn't supposed to even go. It was supposed to be John Keehan who was supposed to go, who was uh, one of the Black Dragons. But John had died in May that year. I had actually left for the Marine Corps, and I had come back. I didn't even have time to prepare. And in November 75, I got a call and said, look, we need, we need a Black Dragon in the event you know, to represent us. And so I ended up you know, being selected to, to in the invitation to go. And they basically looked at me as cannon fodder. They, they all thought, you know, the, the Orientals who brought me over thought, there's just no way. The guy has no real lineage. He, you know, how, how is this guy going to beat us? And, of course, uh, history has shown a totally different story. <laughs> how did this guy beat them? How did you win the Kumite? Take me through the process of becoming the Kumite champion. Well, in those days, you had to understand that it was a totally different mindset. For example, weightlifting was considered a negative in those days. They thought it slowed you down. Uh, cross training was looked at, looked down upon. It was all about pure purity, just you know, the, uh, this koru attitude. That if you really understand your your martial art, your karate, that's all you need to understand. Everything was contained within it. And I came from a standpoint of not being formally trained. And what really I think made it decisive for me is the fact that I learned through observation. And I started to learn patterns and see things like I saw, I decided and I figured it out, there's only 12 angles of attack. I don't care whatever you do, there's only 12 angles of attack and every angle of attack has a corresponding angle of evasion. And by learning how to mix the evasion with the angle of attack, really understanding it as a science, approaching it from a totally different point of view, what I ended up doing is I ended up uh, bypassing the amygdala in my brain. So where the amygdala is where you have hesitancy, where fear kind of breaks in. I started making everything more about autonomic reactions. For example, if you, you know, you, someone knocks a cup, a cup off, the, off the table, people automatically go, boom. They don't think about, oh, catch the cup, mm. right? They do it. Uh, it's the a, it's a same, same reaction. And that became key to me winning because all of a sudden I was faster than the guys. So I got to the point where I could read my opponent, and I read them so well. I, I could go into the ring. I did this with Bob Sapp, for example. I, I walked in the Bob Sapp fight in Tacoma. I predicted 57 seconds the guy's going to go down. He went down in 56. Hmm. All right, I did it for a show uh, the, for the documentary Put Up Your Dukes, for example. They took me into Hooters for the uh, Randy Couture fight in uh, Rock Lesnar. And, and you can see me arguing with one of the guys there. said, you know, he's not going down the first round. He's going down a minute and 30 seconds inside the second. Because I could see... I knew exactly when, there's a thing I call the triangle of force. It's another principle I have. And I know exactly when Randy would always give that up. And I knew how Brock fought. It's just a matter of really having the information and making things work on a scientific point of view. And that's, that's what really worked for me. Plus, back then, you know, in addition to the training, I mean, the, 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 they didn't never trained against the left hook, you know. Uh, and I was famous for a liver shot. Years later, I showed that to a guy in Holland. He showed it to another guy. The guy hit Bass Root, and he went down. And now here, that became his signature, his signature hit. So every time he was hitting people in the liver shot, I just kind of laugh and go, I wonder if he ever realized how, the role I played in that, you know? <laughs> how many opponents did you actually beat to win the Kumite, and how long did the Kumite go for? They're all different, because sometimes you'd go for, it was different. It wasn't, like, sanctioned. So, you know, it depends on where you were. Now, one Kumite match I'm famous for I mean, it was 56, it's 60 bouts, basically, but it's spread over 18 months. Kumite's happened every once in a while where you saw it was kind of that tournament style. But for the most part, the way I accumulated 329 wins is, is they, you know, you'd, you'd go to a city, you have a promoter, and they'd find like four or five tough guys, essentially. And then and you'd fight them. It's more like uh, what you see Kimbo Slice. You, any, you see the backyard British, fights he used backyard to have? Backyard I mean, that's yeah. basically what it was. And that's how I accumulated so many, so many wins. And, the, and then a lot of these guys, they didn't really have a chance against me. Honestly, I'm, I, I'm, and again, you have to understand, I'm growing up in an age where you have no information. Guys never saw, you know, uh, some of the maneuvers I was using. You know, the, uh, it's almost like the early days of the UFC. You know, people weren't prepared for the grappling. 
were totally, they were a victim of it. Yeah. They were totally taken down. And that's what the, the Gracies were betting on, that lack of information. But as what, what happened as time went on. More people got into the grappling, they became more rounded. A whole different fight culture. Up next on The Voice Versus. Do you think that the UFC, which was uh, established in 1993, was inspired in the large part by your accomplishments? I know it was. How would a 19-year-old Frank Dukes, just having won the Kumite, have fared against current UFC fighters, Anderson Silva, uh, Chris Weedman, any of the current UFC fighters? Well, it's, it's, you know, you're comparing apples and oranges. You know, it's, I don't, I don't want to be disrespectful to, to them. Uh, in many ways, we had it harder because we're fighting with no gloves. Uh, the rules are a little bit harsher, but at the same time, these young men and they, there's, they're, they're more, they're, they have a greater obstacle. And the obstacle is this: you're living in an age of information overload. The reason we had the Kumite and where this all came about it's really ironic. It was about getting information. You couldn't get information. You couldn't pull the secrets out of people. Well, what's your style about? That's why we used to have these challenges. That's why people don't understand about the, the Kumite. It wasn't about, again, asserting your identity as a man. It wasn't about fame. It wasn't about money. It was about learning. It's the only way you're going to pull something out. We didn't have internet. We didn't have video. You know, Blackpot Magazine was a joke. I mean, come on. You know? So, where are you going to go? Do you think that the UFC, which was... Uh, established in 1993, was inspired in the large part by your accomplishments? I know it was. I mean, the first thing, it was called the Ultimate Fight Challenge. I was known by Victor Moore as the Ultimate Fighter, the Ultimate Fight, fight Champion. Nobody could beat me. I, have an un, I, I retired undefeated. I mean, truly undefeated. There are a lot of guys running around saying they have undefeated records in my era. I won't mention their names, but I can name four or five people who beat them. Okay. They ended up for a year, Art Davies, before that fight came, contacts me. I'm 13 years retired, and they're trying to challenge me to fight in this thing. In the first UFC? First UFC. Mm -hmm. Okay? And they're going to call it the, to honor me, the way they explain, the, the representative talked to me. They're going to call it the ultimate fight challenge. So with that, with that, just to jump in there, would that lead us to believe then that the first UFC was originally planned as a testament and planned around you rather than being a plan of the publicity of the Gracie family? No, it's a combination of both. It's, it's, not, it's not one or the other. It was there, that was part of their whole, they were doing $100,000 challenges all the time. Right. You know? Um, but the thing is, the, the reason they got that name, the reason, if you look at the format of it, it's all blood sport. Yeah. Okay? I don't think there were time limits. I don't think there was, right. everybody had from different styles, right? right. Uh, the rules were di totally different. The only thing that made it uniquely theirs is they put it in a, in, a, in a cage. And the appeal of it was, because it was a cage like that, was they were trying to, I think, market it sort of like wrestling. And so they were doing this Mau Mau thing. And for a year, I had a guy, I won't mention his name, but for a year, this guy is, is doing this Mau Mau thing to the point I had to get a restraining order mm. on him, trying to get me to, in this fight. Finally, I go to the Draca Martial Art Festival. He does a, 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 uh, this whole wrestling mau mau thing, gets a crowd around, let's fight. I finally said, look, if you really feel that way, there's a challenge and we're going to take it right now, do it now. The man you're talking about is Zane Fraser. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It was at the Century City Plaza Hotel in Los Correct. Angeles, 1994. Go on. Correct. Uh, actually, it was 1993. That, they twist that date intentionally, by the way. Okay. Because that would make really sense, 93 before the UFC, just right. before the birth of UFC. That's right. And that's, that's why they try to say it's 94. It's 1993. Okay. And it's three months before, three to six months before that fight took place. So tell me what happened that day, 1993, you and Zane Fraser. It was really one of those WWE moments. I mean, you had to be there. Even the crowd started laughing at him at that point. He had to walk off. He comes back 20 minutes later, and I'm signing in a... Uh, autograph for this kid at the booth and when we're just setting up and Zane knows I'm, I'm blind out of the side because of because of my injuries and I hear my voice called out 
I, just as I turn, he hits me, clocks me with brass knuckles, hoping to drop me so he could say, we knocked brass me Brass knuckles. Brass knuckles. And there's a medical report to prove it. You can even see four indentations, square indentations in my head, in, including to the skull. Oh. Now, for a year, I told you this guy's hounding me. And uh, lo and behold, you know, um, I got him contained. I, I got him on the ground. I locked him up. Um, I'm just getting ready to put a triangle choke on him, and all of a sudden I'm kicked in the back of the head, and next thing you know, I've got five other guys jumping in on me. And now I'm fighting him and four other, five other guys, and they're, I'm not, and they're UFC guys. By myself, 13 years retired, right? Wow. Still recovering with injuries, mind you, from two brain tumors, you know, at the time. And they, they couldn't handle me. Even recently, Sports Illustrated, they were called up and they asked me about this whole thing, doing a story on the 20-year anniversary. They were given where to find the, 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 um, the court documents. They were given a declaration by my attorney. They were given statements by John Monty. You don't hear a thing. They just totally pigeonhole it and just give Zane Frazier's and Art Davies' account of it don't tell you anything of the backstory of how they were for a year trying to find me in this thing. And, and uh, just say, oh, Frank Dix denies it and then made up some kind of thing just to pay me in a bad light. And, that, and unfortunately, that's, that's been what's really kind of been plaguing me for a lot of times. I got to a certain point of success, and because of other people's bad actions to cover it up and protect their brand, and that's what this is really all about, that I get pigeonholed. Coming up on The Voice Versus... One day I had a guy roll up in a Rolls Royce and he, he threw $25,000 down on, the, on my table and says, I want you to go kill the guy down the street. To clarify, the man down the street is Steven Seagal. Frank, let's talk some of your espionage work. You, you never claimed to be a card-carrying CIA member. Yeah, correct. But you did covert work for the CIA. During a time when America, as you say, was involved in five secret wars, what wars were they and how did you become involved with the CIA? Well, first of all, I, I, I didn't work for the CIA and I want to make this real clear, okay? Uh, any involvement I had with them was tangentially by dealing with people who were in the agency like William Casey. Uh, but the person I actually worked with uh, was uh, Robert Ames Mayhew. And Mayhew those don't know history, he was the alter ego to Howard Hughes' empire. He also was involved in the planning of the Bay of Pigs. Um, he was the head of station chief for the FBI of Seattle, Washington. Um, and uh, just, you know, I really fell under the order, my, my chain of command was actually the uh, National Command Authority, which went to the president. And my job was really more of internal, internal affairs at one point where it was really just looking into making sure guys weren't using the color of authority in what they were doing. And then later on, I, as I did that, I found out of a, a plot, if you would, to take us to war with Iran and Iraq, which happened under the guise of we, you know, weapons of mass destruction. That was, and that was in my book. While we're talking about your book, I, I have it here, and I, I actually read it in, uh, in two days. It reads like a, a born novel, a little novel, it's incredible. But I do want to ask, you know, you wrote the book while on your deathbed. Well, and it, well, does it mean that maybe you embellished any of the stories, knowing no, that I mean, you probably I, weren't going to be alive to see it get published? Well, no, here, first of all, I want to make something very clear. Okay, the book was assembled by a guy named Scott Davison from my notes. I was very ill at the time. I, I kind of like lost my voice in it, if you will. There were so many editors involved in the process. It was like too many, you know, cooks in the kitchen. Um, but the book was uh, very powerful. I mean, the CIA came out and gave a formal, you know, denial. Hadn't done that since... Which is the only time that's happened. Yep. To yeah. any book. Yeah. A lot of great stories in the book. Mm -hmm. A lot of crazy stories in the book. Part of the book, you talk about your dealings with a Serbian outlaw named Ljubo Magas. Yeah. You wrote, and I quote again, he had seen me fight under circumstances in which savagery was necessary for survival. Can you describe one of these incidents of savagery in your fighting that uh, Lubo Magas might have seen? We fought in an ice ring, and I remember pounding a guy's head in the ice. 
so he was just so big and so strong that I just I literally cracked his head open just wow. because it was allowed. It was di you got to understand it's a different era. Who was Voya Goric? Oh, Voya, I love Goro. Voya. Tell me about him. Probably the most fierce man I ever met in my life. What made him so fierce? He, he had a, a. I mean, he was he was a he was an anomaly. I mean. Voyo was the guy, if you ever see the movie Rambo 2, okay, he's the guy who um, Sly Stallone fights in the helicopter, okay? What people don't know about that fight scene is Voyo is yelling at Stallone, hit me, what are you, a girl? Hit me. Because he didn't understand you could pull punches in the movies. He was expecting him to really hit him, so he would hit Sly, <laughs> you know? <laughs> These are characters you met doing espionage work overseas. Yeah. Well, yeah. Who was Fatal de Coveney? That was me. <laughs> that was me. An alias of yours? Yeah. Have you ever mm. killed a man? That's a... It's not a question I care to answer. Let's put it this way. It's not a very civilized question. When I interviewed Steven Seagal for this show, yeah. uh, speaking to him the night before the interview, and he said there were several things he didn't want to be asked about. And one of them was his covert work for the CIA. Mm. From your dealings with people in the CIA, do you believe there's any truth that Steven Seagal was involved in covert operations for the CIA? Well, I do know for a fact a couple of guys who actually worked with, with Steven, but not in the way that I think people portray it. Um, Steven's a very real guy, and I get upset when people try to, say, paint him a certain way. For example, there's a reason the guy got, runs around with tote bags full of guns and his, his things. He lived a certain life. He, he mixed with the wrong people. I mean, he deserves to have, be able to have those kind of weapons in his, at, his, at his fingertips. Because, you know, you have to get permission to do that. You yeah. can't just walk around with that, obviously. No, these threats are, are, are very real. You know, I got on really well with Stephen. He was a fantastic mm -hmm. guy, polite to me, and uh, I'm intrigued. How did you first come to meet Stephen Seagal? Well, I had a we had schools competing with each other, actually, down the street from each other. Uh, but one day I had a guy roll up in a Rolls Royce, and he, he threw $25,000 down on, the, on my table and says, I want you to go kill Steven, so kill the guy down the street. I understand you. And he knew me from, this guy knew me for, as an operator. He didn't know me as a martial artist. He knew me, he thought, because I had worked undercover, he knew my undercover identity. To clarify, the man down the street is Steven Seagal. This guy wanted you to take out Steven Seagal. St take out Steven Seagal. So first thing I did is check with my handler how, how to handle the situation. He said, well, immediately go over there and warn the guy. He says, well, just keep it that way and just turn down the money. You know what I mean? And I, I ended up rolling over there. It was me and a guy named Bear Trap Smith. And Bear Trap was a, a student of mine. And you have to understand, ex Green Beret, who was one of Elvis Presley's um, bodyguards. He's the one who went to jail for hitting the guy with a, mm. a pistol. Uh, and, I mean, the guy was close to almost 500 pounds. I mean, he was a beast. It's, you know, Stephen didn't, wasn't sure if I was there to hurt him or not because he took a look at Bear Trap. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I only brought Bear Trap because he was there because he had witnessed it. So I didn't want him to think I was making something up. I said, look, you know, you need to take some precautions. And so... He said, I, he shook my hand, he said, you know, not too many people have a laws to turn down the money and, and, and to come, come see me. I mean, because you put, always put yourself in the line of fire here. I mean, hey, man, it's the right thing to do, you know. And we had a mutual respect from that day on. In 1993, you were diagnosed with a brain tumor. Mm -hmm. By 1994, as a result of complications of brain surgery and spinal meningitis, you were left comatose on your deathbed, given a 1 out of 10,000 chance of survival. Did your fight career or any of the situations you came across in your espionage work more so contribute to that condition? All of the above. All of it. I had the, uh, the fight career initially created the injury, but it was, it was uh, being exposed to nerve toxins or special toxins that actually exacerbated it. Mm -hmm. In an interview you once said, and I quote again, mm -hmm. this is you talking about the Kuwaitai in, in, uh, in the Bahamas. My involvement in that tournament was part of a plan launched in 1975 to infiltrate the criminal organizations that organized the fights. It wasn't planned per se. It was just I was moving in those circles. That's one of the reasons why I was recruited. You know, um, 
he, he, people understand the the whole martial art industry, especially back in those days. I mean, they, they ran hand in hand with with the criminal enterprises. I mean, you're learning Hungar Kung Fu. It's really it was Tong who taught it. And so, if you're moving that kind of circle, um, you're going to get approached by people who are trying to gather intelligence for a living. And so, yeah, they, I was I was uh, I was asked to go look into things, and that's how I ended up getting sucked into this world. Up next on The Voice Versus. I started to realize what it was all about. And it was, it was really about, you know, manipulation of perception, racketeering, and racism in, in the martial arts. It's one of the reasons I'm writing a book. It's called Ninjas Are Bullshit. I want to ask you some true or false questions. Mm. True or false you once sold a ceremonial sword that you won in the Kumite to attempt to buy the freedom of enslaved children. That's true. There was a practice in the Philippines called uh, Muro Ami. And they were taking children, and it was child exploitation labor. And they'd have these fishing vessels. And the, the, what happened is the parents would sign the kids in, thinking they would come back at the end of the year making $1.25 you know, a day. $400 is a good annual salary in that part of the world, but they're charging them $3 a day to live. Mm. So the kids are indentured slaves at the end of it because parents can't read what they signed. And here's the thing that broke my heart. No sooner I get these kids out of the contract, and I, I'm talking like a sh almost a shipload, that ship is refilled that quick. You know, and here I am trying to bring attention to this thing, and this I don't have words to say with this journalist for trivializing this thing and playing it out. But, the, but here's the thing, 60 of them drowned. I was in a position, I knew it was only a matter of time. They drowned. And it wasn't until 60 kids drowned from those boats that they actually, the go Philippine government was forced to finally do something to intervene. The journalist you talk about, John Johnson, yeah. So he wrote the LA Times editorial in 1988. Yes. Attempting to discredit you. Yeah. He, this he, is this is an article that is often quoted by Frank Duke's haters around the world on the internet. Johnson was an acquaintance of your ex-wife, right? With whom you were engaged in a divorce at the time, right? Do you believe that that was Johnson's motive for writing the piece, or was it, you know, something more sinister for that? What do you think was the motive behind doing this piece in the LA? I have no idea what an, what's another person's mind. I walked into the LA Times before that article was ever printed with all the proof. I had my fight tapes with me. I came with my attorney. The editor of the magazine, and this is why it might be a little more sinister than that, the editor of the magazine, I mean the LA Times, took me aside and said to me, look, there's nothing you can do. And they used the name North, Oliver North, because I was scheduled, I didn't realize it, to testify and I write contract. And what I would have said would have impeached his testimony. Of course, his testimony was eventually impeached, and everyone knows Oliver North went to jail. True or false, you once threatened to throw Jean-Claude Van Damme off a building top. True. True or false, Bola Jung actually choked an actor unconscious on the set of Bloodsport. True. True or false, you were the first and maybe only Westerner to ever train and advise the Verkut, the top secret elite anti-terrorist unit of the Ukraine. True. True or false, you're named as a contributing source in the creation and compilation of the elite U.S. Navy SEAL CFC Spec War Manual K431-0097 that's in use today by special forces and clandestine special ops groups worldwide. True. True or false, your military records were rewritten to eradicate certain events and things in your records. True. True or false, you remain an active undercover off-the-books employee of the CIA. That's a very good question. True or false, you used to use a double to answer media interviews for you while you were clandestinely abroad. I hope I'm speaking to the real Frank Dukes right now. True or false, you were once conferred the rank of a Soviet army captain. True. 
true or false, you appeared in the movie Highlander? False. Damn it. <laughs> Great film. <laughs> Worse. <laughs> That's false. True or false, you hold a tug of war record where you stood on one leg and 66 people couldn't pull you down. True. I did that in Zug, Switzerland. I actually did it again in the uh, International Martial Art Festival. The, no, the Martial Art Expo in Mexico City. I did 100 people. True or false, you've broken bulletproof glass with a single punch. True. Although I have to say they, they call it bullet-resistant glass. Hallie Warden once called you, and I quote, mm. probably the most controversial exponent in the history of martial arts. How does that make you feel? I get a little angry at it for one reason, because controversy is not the right word. Controversy sometimes establishes that there's maybe some truth behind it. And, and the truth of the matter is I'm probably the most pigeonholed martial artist because I, I wasn't, I didn't fit the mold that these pe certain people wanted. I was a threat to their economic gain. I started to realize what it was all about. And it was, it was really about, you know, manipulation of perception, racketeering, and racism in, in the martial arts. It's one of the reasons I'm writing a book. It's called Ninjas Are Bullshit. There's no evidence to support the ninjutsu as a martial art. There's no any historical evidence. Ninjutsu is nothing more than an umbrella word like walking. And it's not even a title or a position. It is a job description. I was bringing light to that in the 1980s, and this was a major money maker for the magazines. And I'm raining on their parade. You're darn right they pigeonholed me. I couldn't advertise in, in the magazine. I was, I'm not allowed. There's contractual arrangements between the guys who are saying they're ninjas and selling ninja, ninjutsu self-defense manuals. And it's a huge, huge consumer fraud. And, and I'm the one who's being called a fraud when all I'm, the, I'm the one who actually knew the truth and I was fighting for people to, so they weren't being taken advantage of. 1994 seemed to be the worst year of your life. Yeah. You were assaulted, as we mentioned earlier, at the Drucker Martial Arts Festival by Zane Frazier. You were diagnosed as having two brain tumors. Actually, it was 93. 93. Was, yeah. But so let's go 93, 94 period was the worst period of your life. Yeah. Assaulted by Zane Frazier, mm -hmm. diagnosed as having two brain tumors, mm -hmm. then as having meningitis. Mm -hmm. Yes. You had a facial neurone, which meant you had to have uh, some of the muscles in your face cut. Uh, the Northridge earthquake destroyed your home. Right. Uh, you ended up in a coma. Mm -hmm. Your wife left you. Yeah. I don't think I've heard of anyone having a worse year than you did between 93 and 94. How do you get through something like that? Well, again, remember I told you having that mindset. You, if you don't have the mindset like you're dead already, like I was telling you about, that you, can, you won't, you won't, you'll, you'll, you'll internalize everything. And that's, that's what's, I was very blessed in, by some great men who saw some real hardships in their life, who had to overcome what you might call insurmountable odds, and they survived by having that attitude. And that's, that's the way you survive it. You have to function. I function along the lines of trying to serve my higher purpose. And so no matter what a person does to me, whatever, I just look at it as, okay, it's a roadblock to getting to where I need to go. But that's what defines us as, as human beings. That's, that's what, uh, you know, probably why people still talk about me to this day. It, it, I don't go looking for it. I don't have a PR agent. Probably if I did, I'd probably be super rich or something, you know, but uh, I just do the best I can. I mean. One of the things I always found really kind of weird is I would be accused of, like, exploiting ninjutsu or, um, you know, doing things. And I, I don't even charge for the lessons. You know, if you talk to the majority of people who came, who trained with me, uh, I went into the poor neighborhoods. I went to Mexico. I could have opened up in Beverly Hills right after Bloodsport. I could have sold DVDs and home instructional courses and done the whole nine yards. Why didn't I do it? You know? because I was really focused on my higher purpose. I was really focused on something else. And when you do that, that's richness. That's real richness. And that's why I've been able, many times in my life, to face death straight, straight, you know, straight away. I had a very 
blessed life because I grew up in an era, and I feel sorry for these guys, but I grew up in the Valley of the Champions where the greatest martial art legends of all time, and I don't we'll ever see that in history again because there was no internet and this stuff. They all gathered. I mean, if you can imagine this. Within a five-mile radius, you had 20, 30 world champions all bigger than life, and I'm growing up with this. And I'm going from school to school to school and being able to watch them and hear them and see things that they didn't even see in themselves and be able to put that together and form my own style. You know, how can I, how can you top that? Frank Dukes, thank you for joining on The Voice Versus. It's been an yep. absolute pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you.